Thank you so much, Charlie, and it's so nice to be here. And so wonderful to talk um, to all of you who have this great interest in preservation and to talk about this great iconic structure. As the lights dim, let me just ask, how many of you have been to Falling Water? That's a good chunk, okay, even though it's out west in, in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I hope what I will be able to tell you today may be some things that would uh, amplify what you already know and en enlighten uh, your already passionate interest in the building. Um, just historically, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright got a good reputation for himself building prairie houses at the turn of the century. Uh, and then he had this um, personal uh, quirk of running off with a client's wife with Mamo Cheney and uh, going off to Europe and being hounded by the press and being vilified uh, and all of his clients deserting him, coming back to the United States, building Taliesin for Mamo. Uh, she was in Taliesin with her two children when the terrible disaster struck, as you probably all know, and a crazed servant burned the house down and murdered Mamo and her children. Uh, and that was the end of Frank Lloyd Wright's career for 20 years. So from that 1911 disaster, he had no work for 20 years except for the Imperial Hotel. And he was down and out. He needed money. In 1932, he got this brilliant idea of starting uh, what he termed a school where people would pay tuition to come and study with him, but it was really to work for him uh, in the apprenticeship or the fellowship. Uh, and I was privileged to know Edgar Taffel in his last 20-something years of his life very well. Edgar was one of the original apprentices in 1932, who was the chief apprentice uh, who did the drawings of Falling Water. So a lot of what I know about this building comes from my friendship with Edgar, who just died this year at almost age 99 in January. Um, let's just go through a little bit. Uh, again, as everybody has said, when you work on something like this, it's not the work of one person. There were other consultants that we had, although we were the prime consultant, somewhat unusual for a structural engineer to be the prime consultant. There was no architect insulating us from the client. We worked directly with them. The house uh, is now owned by the Western Pennsylvania Conservatory, the largest uh, conservancy, rather, the largest land conservancy in the United States, and its executive director, uh, Linda Wagoner. We had uh, consultants for post-tensioning. Shupak and Suarez, Mario Suarez, helped us on that. We did non-destructive testing with GBG, an English company that now is located in the United States as well. The post-tensioning was done by VSL, and other um, structural work was done by Structural Preservation Systems, and that's a sister company of them. There were architectural um, repairs that were necessary that was done on a separate contract, parallel work done by WASA in New York. Let me start out by giving you a little background and a description of the problem. Uh, <clears throat> this is, of course, the iconic picture of the house taken from down below where the waterfall is. Um, these are drawings that are taken from the book that was written at the 50th anniversary of the house 25 years ago. Today it's the 75th anniversary of the house. It was built in 1936. And a new book is out now, which has more spectacular photos. But these drawings, done by Lou Astorino, a Pittsburgh architect, uh, give an idea of how the house is, is actually constructed. You can see um, it's really built on top of the waterfall, and uh, there's a big, massive boulder here, which Mr. Wright instructed would be the first floor of the house, and that's how they determined where it would be, and it's, it is the hearth of the fireplace, actually. There are uh, four main structural supports coming out of the water. Three of them are concrete, one, two, three. The fourth one is masonry. These are called bolsters, or piers, and they're just sitting on the bedrock in the stream bed up on top, and you can see some of the projecting boulders here. These four elements are the main part of, one of the main parts of our story and what sits on top of those. Uh, on top of the four bolsters is the first floor. This is an upside down structure. The concrete slab is actually on the bottom. So when you stand underneath the house from the falls and look up, you see the concrete slab. From the top side, you see an open egg crate kind of a thing. And what you're seeing here is, on top of these four bolsters, you see one beam here with a funny cutout, two, three, and then the fourth one here, which is um, on top of the masonry wall, and here's that boulder for the fireplace that projects through. These are four main concrete beams, three feet wide by two feet deep, and then going across in the other direction, 
are these concrete uh, joists, as it were, four inches wide and two feet deep, spaced about four feet apart. And you can, uh, the finished floor is on top of that, which we'll see in a minute, uh, and you can pick up the finished floor and get at this concrete work. In the end wall, the south parapet, a very important part of our story, are two window frames. They're rectangular steel window frames made out of little two and a half inch T's. Remember that, big part of our story. Um, then you can see all of the masonry that's built up there, the piers here, 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 all made out of local stone, stuff that came out of the site. It's a local sandstone. <clears throat> it was built with wood scaffolding coming up out of the stream and classic kind of stuff. You just hammer it together and nail it together till you get it strong enough. The second floor, which is very much like the one below it, uh, has this master terrace sticking out here, and then the master bedroom is in here. Um, this is an open trellis work here, and now you can look down at the floor below and see the stone covering that covers up that egg crate kind of construction. So that's essentially how the house is put together on these various trays, and it is built on top of the waterfall, as you see. We got a call one day in 1995 from the executive director, Linda Wagoner, and she said, how would you like to work on a problem we have at Falling Water? Well, you know, if you're in the preservation business and you get a call like that, you kind of gasp because I don't know if you know this, but Falling Water has been voted by the National AIA as the best all-time work of American architecture. So if somebody asks you to work on number one building in America, you know, it's, it's a staggering kind of responsibility. It's very scary in some ways and, and, you know, very flattering in others. And of course, we jumped at the chance. So what's the problem we wanted to know? Well, Linda described that when you, this is this, the view that you see when you come in across the bridge, and that uh, the area right above here, which is a, a, there's a masonry pier under here, uh, has some cracks, and I'll show them to you in, in more detail. Um, bigger cracks here. And these have been apparent ever since the house was built. And every time they patch the cracks, a little while later, they open up again. Well, you know, this sort of sets off an alarm bell in an engineer's mind. Um, it's a concrete building, and we always expect cracks in a concrete building. But you would think after 60 years that the cracks would have stabilized. <coughs> This seems to indicate that there's a cantilever and it's deflecting, and as it deflects, it cracks. Um, I don't know how many of you are engineers here, but many people think that concrete is an extremely rigid, solid material, which it is, and that it doesn't move. That par second part is not true. It does move. Um, there is a phenomenon in concrete which we call creep, or the real name for it, I guess, is plastic flow. And it goes something like this. If concrete is under continuous load, being compressed or squeezed together, it will, in fact, compress itself slightly uh, and respond to that load by shortening and getting smaller. If it's in a column, it'll get shorter. If it's in a cantilever beam, it'll deflect a little bit. And 90% of that creep happens in the first year of the life of the building. The last 10% comes out after maybe 10 years, and then it stabilizes and you don't get creep anymore. So the question here is, what's happening? The load on this building is not changing. It's a dead load building. It's the weight of the building itself. The people in here don't weigh very much. They're insignificant. Why is it cracking every time they repair it? This is a question that we say to ourselves um, bears you know, some investigation. Um, you can see the cracks again here. And you can see them in reference to the concrete pier behind, I'm sorry, the masonry pier behind. Here's a masonry pier, and the cracks are right at the point in the cantilever where the stress is the highest, if indeed this thing is acting as a cantilever hanging over the waterfall. Down below, you can see the edge of the bolster here, this triangular thing here, and the, the masonry pier sits on the edge of that, and there are concrete beams over it. Well, so far, the evidence has been anecdotal. They tell me it cracks every time they fix it. But what does that mean? We wanted to know, is it really ongoing movement in the building or is something else happening? So we suggested that they install some kind of monitoring system. On the left is something called a uh, crack meter. On the right, something called a tilt meter. These are electronic 
gauges that measure movement. You can see the blue wires coming out of them. And inside that metal tube is a vibrating wire. And the technology is such that if it shortens or lengthens, we can record it to the nearest one thousandth of an inch. What we did is hooked it all up to an electronic system. And on the right side is one week's worth of data. And we have the elongation, we have the tilt, and we have the temperature and humidity at the bottom. And if you count carefully, I think there are seven peaks and seven valleys, because the movement is diurnal. Um, as the temperature goes up during the day and the building expands, the crack closes. As it gets cold at night and the building shrinks, the crack opens. Same with the tilt. So there is a pattern to that. And we would expect that to vary on a daily basis. But the question is, on a long-term basis, is this crack really getting bigger? If it opens and closes every day, that's not so serious. But if it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger all the time, that is something we want to know. We monitored this for 17 months. The information was fed into a data logger, which you can see on the floor here, downloaded into a computer, and the data sent to our office. If you really want to get fancy, you can have a telephone dial-up system and get it instantly. We didn't need that, but they would send us the disks. And we analyzed it over 17 months. And indeed, we found that the building was still moving and deflecting downward. This is an alarming conclusion. Because when we did a survey, we found that one corner of the terrace was down seven inches, another down five and a half inches, over a short cantilever of 15 feet. This is a huge amount. When you're in the house, you experience it. I don't know if those of you were, were, who were there, were, whether they pointed out how the doors are all racked and they've been uh, adjusted to take care of that. You can't play marbles on the floor here. Um, it's all downhill. <laughs> There's just nothing level. Uh, so the house is way out of whack. And the question is, it's going more and more that way. And um, the conclusion is, it's someday it's going to wind up in the river. Did Mr. Kaufman, the owner of this house, ever um, measure it? Uh, we should go back and say a little bit of the history of how the house got uh, built. Um, you know, Edgar Kaufman was a department store owner in Pittsburgh. And his son, Edgar Jr., was a painter and an artist who decided he would like to study architecture for one year. Not to be an architect, but to get an idea of what it was about. And he heard about what was going on at Taliesin, contacted Frank Lloyd Wright, and was accepted in the fellowship because he could afford to pay. And he went for a year, met Mr. Wright, and uh, introduced his father to him. And Mr. Wright did uh, his father's office in the Kaufman department store in Pittsburgh, because uh, Edgar Kaufman Sr. was a department store owner. And then eventually, uh, the site of the, the land, which had been a summer camp for the women employees of the Kaufman department store and now became their vacation home as, as a family, um, Mr. Kaufman went to Mr. Wright and said, would you design us a weekend house there? And that's how it all started. So uh, after the house was built, Mr. Kaufman realized that it was, uh, it was moving a little bit. Uh, and he had his caretaker, Earl Friend here in the blue jacket, go out and put a stick between the second floor and the first floor, and measure. And Earl would come back and say, it, there's no difference. It's this, this stick fits tight all the time, and I can get it in and out. Of course, what Earl didn't realize is that the two were moving together. Um, I reported this, this, this new book on falling water that just came out this year has a chapter that's on the strengthening of the building that I wrote. And I re reported that anecdote. And if you go onto Amazon and you look up reviews of the book, Earl Friend's son has criticized me very strongly for that statement. And I really wish I could take it back now, because I didn't know. Uh, but according to the son, Earl said, that's the wrong way to measure. We should be measuring from the house to the stream. And of course, Earl was right. He should have. But he had been told to do it this way. So I don't want to blame Earl for this. I would blame whoever told him to do this. Um, but it wasn't that they completely ignored it. On the other hand, they really did. Because over the 25 years or so that they lived in the house, they only had about three sets of measurements, and nobody ever paid any attention to them. So our monitoring was done uh, over an intensive 17-month period. We found out the building was still moving, and we made a report to Falling Water. They had an advisory committee on uh, the building. Uh, of course, you know, we sounded a rather alarming note that this building 
is in danger. It could wind up in the river, and it's the best all-time work of American architecture, and you're the stewards of the building. So their first question was, is it safe? So how would you answer that? <laughs> what would you say? First of all, there was no change from day one in this building. Whatever was going on then is going on now. It was not a question of any deterioration. There was no rust in the building. It had been, the concrete is painted. The water doesn't get at any of the concrete or the reinforcing. The load hadn't changed, yet it was still moving. Um, we, we said, well, we better do a little analysis. So um, we, we went back and we started to look at drawings. And we found this drawing, which is the original reinforcing drawing that shows this upper terrace. The cracks that we noticed are right here, just to the left of this masonry pier, the maximum uh, point of cantilever bending moment. If this big thing is a cantilever, that's its maximum point. Um, the story goes something like this. On the day that they decentered the formwork from this building, that is, they knocked the props out, it deflected an inch and three quarters. Now, that's about right. If you were to do a calculation for what it should be, they should have cambered it up an inch and three quarters, and so when they took the formwork out, it would have come back level. Well, they didn't, so it deflected, and of course, it cracked here right away. Now, everybody was alarmed, and they called back to Taliesin. And uh, they said, what's going on here? Would you check your calculations? There were two engineers for this project. One was Frank Lloyd Wright's son-in-law, Wes Peters, who was an MIT graduate, both an engineer and an architect, and a very good engineer. The other was Mendel Glickman, a Madison, Wisconsin engineer, also a very good structural engineer. So they called Glickman back, who had done this calculation. He said, wait a minute, let me look. And he goes, the, the story is that he goes back and he looks at his drawings, and he looks at this point, he said, oh my god, I forgot the negative reinforcement. You can see this bar here, it just stops with a hook. It should have been continuous all the way out to the end. Um, so there isn't any reinforcing here. Of course it's a crack. Um, not to be surprised about that. On the other hand, did anybody ever do anything about that? Well, <laughs> we don't know. But oh my god, I forgot the negative reinforcement. So, I mean, there was some awareness that something was, was going on here. Uh, we had these other drawings that indeed showed other kinds of reinforcing, including the metal window frames, which are here, which are going to play an important part in the story, because you'll see that they actually do serve to hold up the end of that cantilever. So we had the original drawings from the Frank Lloyd Wright archive out in Taliesin West. Um, we decided what we needed to do is find out how much reinforcing is in these beams. When we realized that the window frames were also supporting the end of the floor, we realized we needed to look at reinforcing not only in that master terrace upstairs where the cracks were, but also down on the main floor. So we took up some stones, and they had done this before, by the way, because of the outside terraces. They had picked up stones so they could waterproof it. And we got down to the top of the concrete beams here, and we put chalk marks on them because we ran across it with radar. We didn't want to start chopping in there and doing probes because we had the sense that the stress in these beams was really high. And any diminution of the strength in that beam by making a probe was something I didn't want to chance, at least before I knew what was going on. So we sent one of our engineers, a small guy, this is John Matteo, he's very nimble, down into the hole there, it's only two feet deep, and he was looking for cracks, and he found some cracks. He had a flashlight down there with him. We also got radar techno technicians out there, GBG. Uh, here on, in the left slide, you can see him running the transducer across the beam in both directions. They are calculating uh, where the reinforcing is. They can get a rough idea of how big it is as well. Then up on that master terrace, uh, where the cracks were, where, oh my god, I forgot the negative reinforcement. They're testing that as well to see how much reinforcement there is in there. Uh, when we got all done, we um, tried to compare the amount of reinforcement that we found in the uh, output, and this is the output, by the way, which is something that if you were to read it, you wouldn't know what it is, and I don't know what it is, but these guys do. They know that that means it's a reinforcing bar. <laughs> we found that there was um, a little bit more reinforcing in there than the original drawings had shown. So we back to the archives, and we find a letter written by the reinforcing bar suppliers, who were also engineers. 
They wrote this letter to Mr. Kaufman, who had hired them, and they said, the letter said, Dear Mr. Kaufman, uh, we are your suppliers of reinforcing. We're also engineers. We don't think there is enough reinforcing in the main floor beams of this house, and we suggest that we put in more. Um, Mr. Kaufman is a department store owner. What does he know? So he takes the letter, sends it out to Talies and to Frank Lloyd Wright, and says, Frank, what do I do about this? So Frank Lloyd Wright replies in one of the most classic letters that any architect has ever written. And it goes something like this. Dear EJ, I have done more for you than any owner has a right to expect. And if that's not good enough with you, the hell with the whole thing. <laughs> Signed, F.L. Wright. So here he is, Ed Edgar Kaufman, in this dilemma. Is his engineer right? Is his architect right? He turns to Frank Lloyd Wright and says, if you say it's good enough, that's fine with me. He instructs the engineer to put in just the steel that is on the drawing. Well, it turns out that they didn't do that. They sneaked in a little bit extra steel. And I think they probably did it at their own expense because they couldn't charge him. Um, and uh, good thing they did that. It still wasn't enough, we're going to find out. Now we know how much reinforcing is in there because the radar tells us, and we're pretty sure of that. And we're also sure that the letter that Metzger and Richardson wrote uh, was, was adhered to, and they put that extra reinforcing in. We now know the dimensions of the, of the building, and we know the reinforcing. We can actually do calculations and see what's going on here. Um, we start out by doing a conventional kind of an analysis of that master terrace, the two big long beams, as if they were acting as cantilevers. Now, this is where the crack occurs here, and right under here is this um, masonry pier. And we do an analysis, and we find out how much bending moment. This is a simple problem, by the way, that anybody in Concrete 101 could solve, even in 1935. So it's not like it's some kind of advanced uh, calculation that nobody understood in those years because concrete was new. They very well understood how to make that kind of calculation. It's a simple one. So we, we calculate the bending moment here, and then we find out how much reinforcing we would need. And of course, we know there isn't any reinforcing because the drawings don't show it. Mendel Glickman says he forgot it. There's a big crack there. So we know that the structure cannot resist this kind of bending. Um, and the um, analysis, therefore, of this as a cantilever can't be accurate. Um, but we, we, we do it anyway, just as an exercise. Now, remember the story of the, uh, four, uh, of the two window frames. This is a picture of the living room looking at the south terrace, at the south parapet. And four of these window mullions are bigger than any other. One, two, three, four. If you were Frank Lloyd Wright, I'm sure you would have preferred the window mullions to be only this big, not this fat. But he must have recognized that the cantilever was too big and that he would have had to prop up the end of that second floor. So we took off the covers of these windows. And indeed, there were two, uh, there were, in each of the four frames, there were little tiny steel T's two and a half inches by two and a half inches. We calculated how much load was in there, and they just worked. They were just on the money, that they could carry that much load without buckling. Even though they're two and a half inches, they were braced at the parapets, and it worked. So we say to ourselves, OK, now we can go ahead and feel comfortable analyzing this thing by putting these four supports in there. We've exploded this thing vertically now, so it's easier to see. So we now do an analysis with relative stiffnesses of the various components and say, if we put the load on the building, how would the moments distribute? And we still get a very high level of moment here. And we say, that can't be. We don't have enough reinforcing here to support that uh, kind of moment. It can't resist it. We know that can't be right. Let's assume that that section cracks. There's a way of analyzing concrete as a cracked section. We do that. We still get quite a lot of bending moment in that area, and we, we have no reinforcing there. And so it nominally can take no bending moment. We go ahead, we do a three-dimensional analysis. This is like a contour map of stresses, because not only is it participating as a two-dimensional structure, it's really participating as a three. So we get pretty sophisticated. We come out, finally, with an analysis that shows that there is no real bending moment left up here. There's a tiny bit out here as a simply supported beam. And all of the load is now going down into the first floor. Now we have to concentrate all of our energy on, are these girders strong enough? Remember, there were four 
This fourth one is not a player because it's supported on a column out here where there's a staircase that goes down to the stream. So that's not a cantilever. So we're really only dealing with three. Uh, so we have these three beams that have a huge bending moment in them. We now know the reinforcing in there. We do a calculation, and I can remember the day that we finished this, and my engineer comes to me and he says, wait till you see this. The concrete is stressed to 95% of its ultimate capacity, and the concrete's very good. We tested some of it. 5,000 pound concrete. It was site mixed concrete, and it's 5,000 psi, really strong. Again, thank God. Its, work, it's, it's, its working stress is 4,500. There's no safety factor left. We don't consider 500 psi out of 5,000, 10% as a real safety factor. It's approaching failure. The steel, which they had put extra in, is beyond the yield point, which means that if you bend it and then you take the load off, it doesn't come back. It stays bent. These are horrendous kinds of numbers. And this is what we finally reported to the advisory committee when we said the house is moving, it's going to fall in the water, and the stresses are at this huge magnitude. And that's when they said, is the house safe? And I posed the question to you, how do you answer that? That it isn't any different from day one. And they come back, well, what, is it safe? And I said, well, I'm not even going to answer that question. I want to ask you a question. Are you going to fix it? And of course, their answer was unanimously, yes, we have to fix it. I said, all right, when we go to fix it, we're going to have to shore it up. Instead of waiting, because they didn't have any money, they had to have a fundraising drive, instead of waiting, let's shore it immediately. Then it will be safe, and you can take your time analyzing it, deciding what to do, fundraising, and all of that. But let's get shoring in immediately. So that was the next thing that we did. A system of temporary shoring was put in underneath those cantilevers. And it was put in, again, in the stream bed. We had to divert the water. This is a historic stream. It's, a, it's got some kind of federal designation. We set anchor bolts in the stream. We cored out two-inch diameter rock cores. We saved them and oriented them and marked them. We set the anchor bolts in grout. When we were all done, we drilled the anchor bolts out and we regrouted the cores. So all you see is a little annular ring, <laughs> which you can't see because there's water in there. But I mean, you, you talk about you know, being a Viennese teaspoon maker as a preservationist. <laughs> we really were. Um, but you can see the, on the left slide here, you can see the single line of shoring, which is sort of trust-like. Uh, on the right, it's a common view of it in, in the sunlight where that all goes into the shadow. And you can see one shoring post on the left here, but most of the shoring disappeared. So people still were able to take pretty good camera shots of it. It was interesting because the shoring stayed up for seven, well, six years. And um, it, it wasn't so horrible. It wasn't great. Um, the, the shoring out at the end here was on the edge of this rock, this 10 foot thick rock cantilever. And uh, I didn't want to chance the fact that we would put enough load in there to break it off and make falling water back into a babbling brook. That would have been a disaster. So we shored up the, the rock from underneath as well. That was a very inexpensive thing to do. That was also part of our shoring. Uh, you can see what the shoring looked like here. Um, and remember I said that last beam wasn't of player because there's a steel column here that supported it. So that was one. But then there were the other three bolsters, one, two, three, that, that needed support. Um, this staircase comes down from the house so they could get into the stream. This is at low water in the summertime. Uh, we actually did this work in high water, and they put sandbags and Jersey barriers in here and diverted the stream off to the left side while they worked. All right, so now the house is sure. They're raising the money. How do we fix it? We have some opportunities here to examine. Word got out that falling water was going to be repaired, and every architecture and engineering school in the country assigned it as a problem to their class. Wow. It was great. We got responses from Saskatchewan, from the University of this, from the College of that, and these were terrific ideas. I mean, some of them were so wonderful. Some were fanciful. Some were very serious. Um, and there was a whole you know, series of, of, of propositions. Um, the hardcore preservationists said, let's not do anything. You've got shoring in there now. Leave it in. Admit that the house failed. It'll be part of the interpretive story. Everybody who goes through falling water goes with a docent. The docent will describe that 
there was, a, there was a mistake made, there wasn't enough reinforcing put in this house in the beginning, and we have to prop it up. Well, this is an interesting solution, um, but when we ultimately arrived at our solution, we had a forum in the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh to explain what we were going to do. It was a 500-seat auditorium. There were 600 people in this auditorium. It was wild. One of the judges, as it were, of our scheme, besides Nick, uh, was Eric Lloyd Wright, uh, grandson of Frank Lloyd Wright. And Eric Lloyd Wright said, you know, my grandfather was interested in spaces. Um, in this case, he was interested in the space inside the house. He was interested in the space outside the house. Uh, and the space he wasn't interested in was between the ceiling and the floor. So do what you want in that space, but leave the rest of it as it was and emphasize the spirit of this house, which is cantilever. If you leave the permanent shoring in place, that concept is destroyed. And he was quite eloquent, eloquent in his presentation of that position. And uh, I think he shot down the preservationists who said, leave the shoring in. The second was... Uh, the most popular solution we got, which was put in supplemental steel. On each side of those concrete beams where the joists frame in, cut the joists back, put in some steel to make it strong enough, reattach the, the joists, and put the floor back on it. <clears throat> now, that's a perfectly valid and viable solution, and it's one that we seriously thought about because you could put a big enough piece of steel in there to act as a cantilever. It would work. What it wouldn't do is change any of the existing stresses in the house, which were so high already. They were high enough to make me nervous, even if we had supplementary framing in there. In addition to which, it wasn't a terribly reversible solution, because you had to cut every joist. And it was um, a, a lot of intervention work. But it was certainly feasible and certainly possible, and we probably got 20 schemes from universities that suggested that. The next two are schemes of actually bonding things on to the concrete. One, you can bond steel, and one, you could bond fiber-reinforced plastic, that is carbon fiber or fiberglass. And both of those are very viable solutions and have been used a lot in concrete repair work. Um, particularly FRP repairs now um, use a lot in seismic strengthening and seism seismic repair work. Even bonded steel, we have such great adhesives now. The epoxies are wonderful. Um, so those were possible solutions, and we could have worked either on the sides of the beam or even on the top of the beam where you really wanted to get that reinforcing because it's a cantilever, because we had four inches of uh, space where, there were, uh, where the old wood sleepers were and, and then the stone floor. So we could have done something on the top. Uh, that, too, would not do anything to reverse the high stresses in the concrete already. It would only take additional load. Any additional load that went in there would, would feed into the new stuff and it would be shared on a, on a relative stiffness basis. We weren't too keen on that because, again, it would introduce even more stress into that concrete than was there. So the final solution was the one that we actually came up with the first. It was my original idea as soon as I saw this thing that I got this neat idea of can we do some kind of external post-tensioning? And you'll see what that is in a minute. That has the advantages of not only adding reinforcing, but of being able to reverse the stresses that are in the concrete and the steel now. So that's the solution that we came up with, and let's see how that works. The top slide here shows the existing condition. You have this inverted T-beam, this upside-down T-beam. You can see um, the reinforcing bars in here. They're in the top of the beam. And as the load comes down on here and it bends down and deflects, and this is the point that goes down seven inches over the 15 feet, Cracks open up on the top here as this thing stretches. You can feel the top of that beam in tension, I think. Concrete, of course, is not able to resist tension. That's why we put reinforcing bars in it. That's why it's called reinforced concrete. Our idea was, on the bottom, to somehow attach steel cables to the sides of the beams. We would have to drill holes in the beams. We wouldn't, uh, we, uh, the joists, by, by the way. We wouldn't be able to you know, just fit it in, but it would be a lot less invasive than chopping them out completely. Somehow attach steel cables to the side of the beam, uh, stick them out the front parapet, anchor them at the back, pull them tight, wedge it off, and in this way, 
you'll be able to actually reverse the stresses by picking the building up a little bit here. If you can feel yourself going, uh, you can just feel yourself pulling the end of that beam up. Imagine you're standing up there and the cable is a little bit higher and you, you can actually pull it up. Well, that's what we do and you'll see by the explanation exactly how that works. The scheme was, this is the plan view now, um, the one bolster we're not worried about is this one that's cut out like a keyhole where the stair goes down. The other three, one, two, three, are the three main beams. Here's the fireplace boulder. We are going to put red cables on each side of this beam, each side of this beam. We can only put them on one side of this beam because here we have the stair going down and there's no way to, to get it in. Also, it turns out the stress was a little bit lower here. In addition, because this is really a double cantilever and these terraces cantilever the other way, we're also going to post tension it across the other way with much smaller size cables, but to hold up the terraces as well and uh, try to limit the deflection out there. So we're going to put very high strength bundles of steel wire called post tensioning cables on the sides of these girders. We're going to anchor them at the back here in blocks of concrete. We're going to have a middle block of concrete that's a diverter block that causes this thing to raise up and gives us some drape to it. And then we're going to have at the very end at the south parapet here something called the anchorage, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the, the, the anchorage uh, block where the jacking end is. And the cables are temporarily going to stick through the front of this thing so we can grab them with a jack and pull them. In section, the main cables are here. This is the south parapet. The, they'll temporarily stick the cables through here. They're going to run along the side of the beam. They're anchored in the back to a block of concrete. The diverter block is here, and the jacking block is here. Here's the stream bed with the water, the edge of the bolster. Here's where the crack was. We also were going to put some fiberglass rods up there just so it never cracked again. These are the steel tees that hold up the edge and come down in the south parapet. This green is the temporary shoring that will go away when we're all finished. That's the house. <clears throat> in an isometric, that uh, sketch of the inverted T-beam with the reinforcing bars that are there that are not enough, this big red bundle is 13 strands of a half-inch diameter twisted wire. Each strand is good for 40,000 pounds of tension pull. 13 of them. You can do the multiplication, okay? <clears throat> a lot of force. Um, and then the, the very fine red lines going the other way are the cables that go across to the two terraces. You can see the stone floor is on top of that. There's some sheathing and some sleepers, and we'll see as, uh, what that does here. This is the jacking end here, where there's a piece of, of machined steel here. Uh, through which these cables come. They put a jack on there and they pull the cables tight. They drive wedges in there so the cables can't slip. Take the jack away, cut the cables off, and patch the hole. And now the cable's in a huge tension force and it has the effect of picking up that drooping end. How does it work? Well, they had to rebuild scaffold to get at it. This time, instead of having all that hammered together wood, we have very elegant, this is actually aluminum scaffolding that's very lightweight and easy to install. Um, again, done some of it in the river bottom at, the, bo at the, the base of the falls, some of it up on the top of the falls, but to give them access. In addition, so as not to really trek up the whole house, all of the access is going to be done from outside. So they built a little bridge, uh, which goes, this is the main entrance bridge that you go across to get into the house because the door is in the back. Typical of Frank Lloyd Wright, you can't ever find it. Um, but the access for the workmen was going to be across this bridge. They also had to take out all of the built-in furniture, all the stone on the floor, uh, to get that out of the way so we could get at the concrete. And again, it was the easiest way to get it out across this temporary bridge. Every stone was numbered and photographed, so the orientation was understood. <coughs> um, as I say, the workmen from Falling Water had actually taken up this outside terrace stone before to put waterproofing in so they knew how to do that. They took the stone up. They took up the diagonal floor sheathing, which was actually redwood. And you can see then the sleepers underneath that. Took all of that up 
and now you're down to the bare concrete, which looks like that drawing that I showed you right in the beginning, where you can see the concrete beams and the joists. Then there are these little bricks on top, which were just leveling devices for the sleepers. Now we're down to the bare raw material of the house that we are working on structurally. <laughs> we brought the radar guys back because now they had full rain to go over the whole thing. They checked the, the reinforcing, and we just did one last check of that, and we were pretty sure what we had. There were a lot of cracks that we found in the house, and we decided that if we're going to put this huge post-tensioning force in there, we don't want to waste any of it by closing up cracks. Let's fill the cracks first so that every ounce of post-tensioning we put in there will be used to reverse the high stresses that are in there now. Uh, and that's what they're doing here. They're pumping epoxy into the cracks. You see these little ports, the plastic ports. There's a little tiny jack here uh, with a pump, <clears throat> and they're, they're pumping the, the cracks full of concrete. This is in the ribs, but they did it in the tops of the beams here too as well. So all of the cracks were filled first. Now, we have to attach these new blocks onto the existing beams. We have the end anchorage block, the middle diverter block, and the forward jacking block, three blocks on each side of the beam. We're going to do that by drilling through the beams, and you can see the core drill here, drilling holes. There's one drilled here, one drilled here. They're going to put very ultra high strength rods in there, cast concrete, and turn the nuts up uh, with a jack and turn the nuts up. They're going to post tension those against the sides of the existing beams, and so that when you pull on that, it's going to lock onto the beam in an action called shear friction, as well as these dowels working for you. And it's sufficient that we can resist the pull and, and put that force into the existing beams. So these are going to be new concrete blocks, and they're starting out to drill them here. You can see they have four bars in here. These are the trumpets that will let us get the jack in. <clears throat> this black thing is a hose. It's a hollow duct. And we're going to thread the 13 cables through that and splay them out and anchor them in the concrete block here. The spiral is because the strength, stress is so high that it wants to burst the concrete apart. So we hold it together with a spiral there. <clears throat> you can see this, these things are, are the tubes that go in here. Uh, so we can, the rebar, the uh, post-tensioning rods can slide and, uh, <clears throat> when they pull them. Now they're getting ready. They're going to eventually uh, grout all the post-tensioning rods so these tubes are to get grout in there. But uh, you can see sticking out in the back here each of these wires. There are 13 of them that are splayed out in here. I see one, two, three, four, five, six. There's 13, trust me, that come out the end of this black hose. <clears throat> and we have all these jacking ends here. You have the nuts that are going to be run up tight. You have the, uh, the jacking blocks here. Everything's ready to go to pour that. We encase the blocks with wood formwork. You can see the, the duct here, the black hose alongside here. This is where we're going to, the jack's going to go on the outside of this. This is the diverter block. And this is, they haven't formed this one in wood yet. They've, they formed it on this side, but not the other side. And here they are with a concrete hose. It's a very dark slide, but they're pouring the concrete into these blocks now. And <clears throat> after that, they're going to post-tension them by tightening them up against the side of uh, the beam. And here you can see it's done. Here are the post-tensioning the post rods, one, two. There's two on the other side. And um, you can see another one here. And that's what, what, again, squeezes these blocks on there. You can see the black hose still there, the, the, the duct hose here. Notice there's a shoring tower here and here. <laughs> we were nervous. We were putting so much load in this that we were worried that we might overload these window mullions, these little two and a half inch tees. If they broke or failed, the house could come down. So we decided the better part of discretion would be to build these little shoring towers. If they broke, nothing would happen. We could always replace them. Um, they didn't break. <laughs> but <coughs> Here they are with a very small jack, tightening the monostrand cables and jacking them that hold up the terraces. These are the small cables. But this is the real story. 
the five bundles of 13 cables each that stick through the south parapet and come out onto the scaffolding. They're protected in plastic here, but you can count the five bundles. Each one has 13 half-inch diameter strands of twisted wire. There they are. You're looking at a machined end of the jacking fitting, which is a permanent part of the installation. That's going to stay in place. You're looking at a split wedge here. This is actually after they've been jacked, but uh, it explains how it works. This wedge is a just a piece of, of high strength metal that they, <coughs> when they, they pull these wires tight, there's a ram that drives the wedge in tight. And when you let go of the wire, the wire is nicked by that wedge and it's pulled tight against the surface of the, the face of the, of, of the uh, steel here and the strand can't slip. So it's a, a friction fit that causes this thing to work. Um, <laughs> the best sign of the house. <laughs> we did this in April 2002, and I was pretty well stressed out, I have to tell you. We had just had four months of working at the World Trade Center, every structural engineer in New York, of you know, trying to recover the bodies of the firemen, and it was the worst job I ever did. And I was emotionally kind of wrung out that winter. And then we come out here and working on number one structure in the United States, and worried that if we didn't get this one right, you know, that would be the end of my career. Stressing in progress. Uh, there was plenty of stress going on. Um, but this is what we did. Um, here is a, the, the hydraulic jack that applies 390 tons of force to each girder. I mean, just think of the amount of load that's, that's in this thing. Um, this handle here is the ram end that moves. That's the jacking end. And it moves because there's hydraulic fluid in these two black hoses. Um, safety precaution says that nobody's supposed to be standing out there. Because if you post tension this thing and some of the anchorage fails, it's going to whip one of those cables out. And it's going to be like, uh, you know, literally a horse whip. And anybody in its path will get killed. So of course, <laughs> everybody's out there. Uh, we all wanted to know what was going to happen, what was going on, and what was going to go on. That's me here in the red jacket and the white hat. Um, and this is mostly the construction crew, but you can see there's people filming with a microphone here. Uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of people. This guy is, this, is the uh, VSL superintendent, um, and then the guy's measuring on the jack. I want to show you something here, which is a film clip, and I have to uh, get out of this for a moment. Okay. So here they are. They're putting an extender on the jack because it actually can't fit into that little square hole we've cut in the end of the parapet. But they've threaded the 13 strands through this piece of extender, and they're going to get ready now to mount the jack on here. <clears throat> There's some loose wires at the end that they're twisting just so it doesn't get in anybody's way. Here's the jack. This big guy in blue is unfortunately huge, and I couldn't film through him. Um, but you're going to see these strands come out where his right hand is, where that gloved hand is. And the guy in the red shirt is the measurer. Um, they measure the amount of force that's put into these tendons in two ways. One is the amount of hydraulic pressure that you put on it. The second way is how much the strand elongates. They know how long it is. This thing was about, I don't know, 30-something feet long. And they know, given the amount of force we're expecting, how much it should elongate. So he's got a ruler, and he measures that too. Now, they're putting this thing on, and you can see in a minute that the cables are going to stick through the, the back end of it. There they are. They're, they're, they're stuck through the back. And he's, he's going to grab that handle every once in a while and, and shake it. And that's the ram end um, of, of what moves. This, this handle here is, is actually the jack part that pulls the cables. Everything's done by friction here. He's hooking up the hydraulic cables now. That's what's going to give us the force. It's a rel relatively small pump. And this is the measure. He just wants to make sure with his tape measure. He's just checking every last thing. We stress these cables, one, three, five, two, four. First, 10% of the total load, just to set it. Then another 40%, so that's up to 50. All right, here he goes. He's opening the valve. And then, the second, then we leave that overnight at 50%, and then the second day, we do the last 50%. And overnight, you see if there's any losses. 
Now watch that needle go here. There it goes, up. And I watch the hose straighten out over here. You can see that. Up, there it goes, there it goes, there it goes. He's waiting to get to a certain pressure before he shuts it off. That, 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 that. Done. 20 seconds, it's all over. Seven years of work, and it's over in 20 <laughs> seconds. I mean, it was really quite amazing. We left it overnight for the first night, and come back the next day just praying that you had the same amount of force in there. One way we, pr we were able to do it was to measure with stress gauges. This is a Penn State student doing his master's thesis, by the way, with remote strain gauge technology, very interesting uh, project that he was doing. So we tried to get as many people into this as possible. Somebody said to me, did you try to pick the house back up and get rid of the seven inch deflection? And the answer is no way. The house had adjusted over the years. If we tried to ever lift it back up again, it would crack every single finish, every piece of glass, all the plaster, all the doors that had readjusted and been reset. So the answer was no. We were going to leave it in position. It did pick up 3 quarters of an inch, which is what we calculated. Uh, but that was all. And there was no way that we were going to try to set it back. He's measuring now how much the, the strain was in it. Um, we had all kinds of other strain gauges on it to measure how much deflection. This is the, shore, the temporary shoring beam. And in fact, you, can, you can't see it easily, but it did pick up off the shoring here by about the 3 quarters of an inch, so that part was perfect. Here, it's, it's a little better. The shadow line that you can see here uh, wasn't there before we did the post-tensioning, so it was tight down there. So we knew it had picked up here. And it was just about what we calculated. We all breathed a sigh of relief. Uh, they came in. They put the sleepers back, new sleepers, new floor. It's plywood this time, not uh, diagonal wood sheathing. The stone goes back. They brought the furniture in after they had conserved it. Um, and this is before they repainted it. Uh, you see some of the marks on the bottom after they took the shoring out. But basically, the house looks exactly the same as it did when we started. All right. Interesting. We get it all done, or even in the middle of it, we say, how did somebody make a mistake like this? You know, this is a simple calculation, as I said before two really good engineers. How could they screw this up? How did they make a mistake? Well, my good friend Edgar Taffel is very fond of telling the story how Frank Lloyd Wright only saw the site once. Mr. Kaufman brought him out there before, before the house was built. Mr. Kaufman brought him out there, and he saw it, and he said to him, EJ, get me a topo of the site. So of course, they ordered a site topo. It was delivered to Taliesin. Several months go by, and E.J. Kaufman hears nothing from Frank Lloyd Wright. One day, he's got to go on a business trip, and he calls up from his office in Pittsburgh. He says, Frank, he said, I'm coming uh, to Milwaukee on a business trip, and I thought I'd drive over to Taliesin and have a look at the drawings. And Frank Lloyd Wright says, that would be splendid, E.J. You just do that. He said, I'm leaving tomorrow. OK. So Frank Lloyd Wright gets out the site plan, and he puts it on his drawing board, and he walks past it. And all the apprentices are aware of this phone call and of what's going to happen in three days. The next day, he gets a call from Chicago. And Mr. Kaufman says, uh, Frank, I'm in Chicago. I'm on my way to Milwaukee. I'll see you in a couple of days. And Frank Lloyd Wright says, that will be splendid, EJ. We're looking forward to seeing you. And he walks past the drawing board with the site plan on it. Next day, he gets the call from Mil Milwaukee. And he says, um, well, I'm going to leave tomorrow morning. Uh, and Oh, I'll be over for about lunchtime. Splendid, we'll see you then. He walks past the drawing board. And the next morning at about 7.30, Mr. Kaufman calls from Milwaukee. He says, OK, Frank, I'm leaving at about 8 or 8.30. I'll see you at lunchtime. We're looking forward to seeing you, seeing you EJ. We're going to show you the drawings, and it'll be wonderful. Well, this time, Mr. Wright sits down at the table. And all the apprentices gather around him. And they're all standing there with their knives, and they sharpen pencils for him. And Frank Lloyd Wright is this whiz-bang draftsman. He is so fast. There are films of him drawing, and you can't believe it. I mean, it's, it's like computer. I mean, he just drew so fast. He takes a big piece of tracing paper, overlays the site plan, and the apprentices are astounded to see that he's placed the house on the top of the waterfall, not on the bottom looking up at it, which everybody assumed would be its location. So he draws these four bolsters that we see, lays out the foundation, 
takes another sheet of tracing paper, puts it down, draws the first floor plan, puts another sheet on it, draws a second floor plan. There is a small third floor and a roof. And this takes them the better part of the morning. And they're sitting there astounded because what's coming out of this is just this whole house is pouring out. The butler comes in and says, Mr. Wright, Mr. Kaufman's here. So Frank Lloyd Wright turns to the apprentice and says, OK, boys, while we're at lunch, I want you to draw the elevations. And here's what it's going to look like. So they go to lunch. And Edgar, Edgar Taffel tells the story. He said, I could draw about one-tenth as fast as Mr. Wright. And I took one elevation, and Bob Mosier took the other one, and we struggled to get this thing done in an hour and a half. And Wright had done the whole house in a morning. Um, but they got the elevations done. They brought Mr. Kaufman in, and he was absolutely dazzled by this. And he said, how fast can we get started? And the answer was, we can start right away. Well, they didn't have any working drawings. They had this set of you know, <laughs> stuff. I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright, he was like Mozart. You know, Mozart carried symphonies around in his head and then would sit down and write them. Apparently, Frank Lloyd Wright did the same thing. He must have carried this building around. People say that he had made sketches on the sly in his bedroom before. None of them has ever been found. And I don't know that that's been verified. But for sure, there were no working drawings or big drawings. At any rate, they started this house very quickly after that concept set was done. And there was a complete set of drawings, but we have the feeling that it must have been done so fast that something got lost in trans translation. You know, you know, we, we've all done work, those of us who are professional in the design business, and we say, oh, I haven't got time to do that, and I'll come back to it. I have a feeling that's what happened, and they never came back to it, and it got built wrong. And I, I, I hate to blame anybody because they were first-class engineers, these guys. And anybody can make a mistake. Um, we hope we fixed it. We hope we fixed it for all time. And we hope it'll still be the best all-time work of American architecture. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.